Perhaps above all else, Canadians pride themselves on their defense of human rights. But what happens when those rights invariably come into conflict? In one corner, there is the equality between the sexes. In another corner, you have what many Canadians believe is a right to abortion. But what happens when that right to abortion is being used to specifically eliminate baby girls? It's called sex selection abortion, also known as female gendercide, and it's happening right here in Canada. It's the theme of this year's March for Life, which takes place on Thursday, May 9th in Ottawa. Here's what you can expect at the march. Joining me now in studio to talk about this issue is Dr. Maura McQueen from the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute, also Rebecca Richmond from the National Campus Life Network, and joining us from Ottawa via Skype is Peter Murphy, the Assistant Director of the Catholic Organization for Life and Family. We'll start with you, Rebecca. A Conservative Member of Parliament named Mark Warawa brought the issue to Parliament. What was he proposing? So this member of parliament who's from Langley, British Columbia, he was reacting to a CBC investigation last summer that found that ultrasound clinics in Canada are being used to disclose the sex of preborn children and then people are using that information to get sex selective abortions. And so he was getting reactions from his constituents, he was getting reactions from other members of parliament and he proposed this motion in September that asked the House to condemn discrimination occurring against females through sex selective pregnancy termination. So it was a one sentence motion and it was very similar in wording to the condemnations that the other party leaders and members of parliament had given after the CBC investigations. Mm -hmm. And unlike a bill, it wasn't going to introduce legislation, it wasn't going to bring anything into law or change uh, restrictions or anything like that. It was just giving the House an opportunity to condemn something that most Canadians find is absolutely abhorrent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now we'll talk more a little bit later about some of the particular reasons why Parliament didn't end up even voting on this motion. But Moira, I understand this is the first time that our Parliament has addressed this particular issue. Is this a growing problem in Canada, do you think? Actually, to be honest, it's not really the first time because, and I think this is part, partly what happened in this, I know there are different reasons for somebody not being allowed to speak, but the Assisted Human Reproduction Act of 2004 actually has a clause in that mm. that says no procedures can be done in any shape or form, and they're talking here with uh, in embryos really, so pro process of in vitro fertilization, mm. but no procedures can be done that have anything to do with the gender of a child unless it happens to be illness related. So it is in fact, interestingly enough, I think, covered by the legislation that most people don't know, mm. and there are that other kind of problems. And that stemmed from way back with the Royal Commission on Reproductive mm. Technology which uh, made its report in 1994, so mm. quite far back by today's standards. And even although that particular commission was composed, it was composed all of women, number one, mm -hmm. and nearly all, I would say, very feminist women. Mm -hmm. Suzanne Scorsone from the Archdiocese of Toronto was the only person who actually had a dissenting opinion that, you know, that went in with the official report because mm -hmm. it is okay with abortion and all these other things. But interestingly enough, when it came to the question of sex selection, that's the one area where even that particular commission said this was not to be allowed in mm. Canada. So the, the matter, it's, a, it's, a, it's as usual a question of logic or illogic, I would mm. say, but the matter has been raised before. And in fact, the legislation does deal with it. So 
I but think is that, that only binding then on embryos? Uh, well, that's where it becomes tricky because many people will say by extension, you know, be because of uh, that, the whole, that whole question of uh, is an embryo really different from a fetus, uh, mm. then I, I think it in fact would be held to be, uh, you know, legal mm -hmm. or illegal rather for mm. uh, an abortion to be done knowingly. Uh, in terms of uh, a baby's gender. Mm -hmm. It's completely disregarded, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about what the law says and right. what actually happens. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, Peter, Kolf issued a letter for the March for Life, and, and in it, Kolf writes, when confronted with the reality of sex selection abortion, all but the most hardened among abortion supporters are given pause. What do you think it is about this particular reason for abortion that Canadians find repulsive? I think there are a couple of things that Canadians find repulsive about it. Uh, first of all, just the idea that a female would be targeted because she is in fact female. Yeah, I think the majority of Canadians find that repugnant. But I think more generally, uh, what's going on here is that it's very, very difficult to maintain the illusion or the myth of the unborn child as a, a mere clump of cells once we have identified uh, that child, that unborn child, as a male or a female. Mm. And so instantly, once we personalize the child in the womb, uh, its significance and its value is obviated to the majority mm. of people. And I think that's why the majority of Canadians find the idea of female gender side uh, repulsive. And so you think it's in some ways an acknowledgement that abortion is a violent act, even if people aren't expressing it in that, those terms? Absolutely. I think once, once again, you know, once we realize that we're talking about a male or a female, uh, a male or female what? A male or female person, mm -hmm. uh, a human person in utero. And so I think there's a tremendous pedagogical opportunity here. And I think that was part of the motive behind this whole uh, action. Mm -hmm. Uh, Moira, from your perspective uh, as an ethicist, what distinguishes this from all the other reasons for having an abortion or no abortion or no reason at all for that mm -hmm. matter? Well, from my perspective as a Catholic ethicist, yeah. I mean, I clearly think all abortion is wrong, so mm -hmm. no reason you give can be justified morally, ethically. Mm -hmm. But And so that's what makes it all the more intriguing, I find, that even for secular ethicists, uh, who are very much, I mean, completely pro-choice, they will mm -hmm. say. And really, I do think they do know that we're not talking about clumps of cells anymore. Mm -hmm. It's all the more horrific these days. That was once the argument put forward. But, you know, once we know it's not just a clump of cells, it will change. Mm -hmm. But now we're so aware exactly what it is or who it is more mm -hmm. accurately. And yet that idea, it's an ideology, I think, of it has to be the woman's choice regardless of what is actually going on in the womb. And it's completely turned upside down then because I just don't see what logic that's mm -hmm. put into, you know, what's, that's applied when you, it suddenly comes down only to defense of women but not defense of, of the boy babies. I mean, so uh, in terms of giving an opinion, I mean, I've debated this many times with other, with femin you know, with other feminist uh, people talking about abortion and, and they themselves are stuck, I think, on mm -hmm. this particular one because mm -hmm. I think they share Peter's, Peter's view that uh, Canadians do find it abhorrent, that it mm -hmm. should be about gender but they don't seem to find abortion in principle abhorrent. Mm -hmm. So it is an edge. I'm glad that this motion was, was brought back up mm -hmm. because I think it is an, it could have been an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I don't think it happened there, but at least it's a signal that, again, these issues don't go away. They're longstanding. They'll come back. Now, Rebecca, does sex selection abortion have its defenders? Not exactly, but people are afraid to engage in because they feel as soon as you mention sex selective abortion, all of a sudden you're talking about abortion, you've undermined choice in general. And so you have people like the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada that put out in uh, one of their newsletters in attacking Motion 408 that, you know, it's not none of our business what a woman's reason is to choose abortion, so we have to defend her right to choice completely. But the reality is, although we have abortion on demand in Canada, although we don't have these kinds of restrictions, the majority of Canadians aren't comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. The majority of Canadians think that there should be some legal protection for children sometime before birth. Mm -hmm. So the current reality in Canada doesn't match up with people think, just like it doesn't match up when it comes to sex-selective abortions. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Rebecca, there's an important new documentary about gendercide called It's a Girl, and I understand that you've been showing this on campuses. Mm -hmm. When Motion for It was proposed, uh, this particular issue of gendercide is something that I was following when I was in my undergrad, and I've continued mm. to be researching it throughout uh, my time after graduating. And so when I heard about Motion 408, I said, okay, this, we need to jump on this. We need to educate students about this. We also need to support this member of parliament who's bringing forward this motion. And at the, around the same time, this documentary came out. And so we said, well, wouldn't this be a great opportunity? Because it's an award-winning documentary. I mean, it was screened by Amnesty International and mm. their film festival. It's won awards. It's being shown before the, uh, you know, the house in in the UK. It's being shown on Capitol Hill in the U.S. So this is something that people are watching. Let's bring it to Canadian campuses. Mm -hmm. And so we are able to screen it at 22 campuses this past semester. Well, excellent. Well, we have a lot more to talk about. But first, let's take a look at the trailer for this documentary. It's a girl. Today, India and China eliminate more girls uh, than the number of girls born in America every year. The definition of a genocide is a systematic and methodical extermination of a certain group. And the genocide is that systematic and methodical extermination of a gender group. Why are Indian households secretly and brutally eliminating daughters from their family system. They just wet the cloth and they fold it like this and they put it on the face so the child can't breathe. Immediately the child will die. But what this is, is an entire system, a social machinery that says we don't want females. But the real problem started after I became pregnant, they started asking me for a sex determination. They wanted to know if the children are girls or boys. They started torturing me to get an abortion done. What should I do to save my daughters? He was the trailer for the documentary It's a Girl. To find out how you can organize your own screening, visit itsagirlmovie.com. Back here in studio with Dr. Moira McQueen, Rebecca Richmond, and joining us via Skype, Peter Murphy from Ottawa. Uh, getting back to this motion 408 in Parliament, uh, why was there never a vote? Well, 
private member's business always has to go before a subcommittee of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee. And so it's a four-person committee. It has different representatives of the different parties. And they look at each motion or bill. And an, an impartial expert from the Library of Parliament says, OK, it's votable or it's non-votable. He's looking at different criteria, like does it contradict the Constitution? Is it federal jurisdiction? Are we already dealing it with the Parliament? Are we going to be dealing it with, mm -hmm. with it in Parliament? And so he said to them, it's fine. It's, it's, it's great. It, there's no problems here. It can be deemed votable. All of a sudden you start hearing things like, well, we're concerned that ultrasounds are under health care and that's provincial jurisdiction. Or Motion 312, which wanted to have a, a committee look at the definition of human life in the criminal code. Well, you know, we already dealt with the abortion question. So they declared it non-votable. And then Mr. Warawa had to appeal that to the larger committee, which was ultimately unsuccessful as well. And then he could have appealed it further, but he decided to go with a different bill. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's now dead. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, despite those reasons, one certainly gets the sense that our politicians don't want to talk about this issue. Uh, Peter, what do you think it says about our political culture, even our cultural climate right now, that our, our politicians, including our prime minister, don't want to talk about this issue? I think there's a tremendous disconnect. Uh, the federal politicians generally seem to be out of touch with mm. the opinions of the majority of Canadians. I know that in uh, 2011, a poll showed that 92% of Canadians uh, were opposed to this. And so the fact that they are unwilling to seriously entertain this question and other questions uh, pertaining to uh, abortion, uh, uh, to me, says that there is a disconnect. They, they seem to be out of touch with the, the opinions of the majority of Canadians. And I do agree with Moira that these issues will continue to come up. Mm. And it's only a matter of time before the political balance shifts and uh, there is a, a broader perception of public opinion being able to support uh, uh, political views as well so that we have a change politically uh, on these issues. Mm -hmm. Um, Moira, Rebecca, what do you think about Peter's point that, that perhaps our federal politicians are out of touch with the majority of the population on the issue of sex selection abortion? Do you agree? Yeah, I do. I do agree. I, I think it is true. I mean, especially as you've already pointed out, that people who are diehard pro-abortion uh, seem to draw the line themselves at this area. And some of the, as I was mentioning in that commission, um, the, the people there, I mean, some of them were geneticists people, mm. and, and extremely feminist but had a problem with that one particular issue. Mm. The logic, again, is a different thing, but the, I do think that most, most people really do think that the gender is somehow, I mean, mm. I'm very glad, of course, but most people do seem to think that gender shouldn't be a reason mm. at all for abortion. And so it, it is, if you like, a chink in the armor, I think, mm. myself, uh, because I think it's something that people just have to constantly point out that, you know, if you can make exceptions to this apparently pro-choice which should cover the whole gamut then mm -hmm. in fact you don't really have a very sound platform yourself so mm -hmm. what other reasons are there for saying that abortion is wrong and you know once you once you're defending girl babies i mean i still don't see why why are you not defending boy babies mm -hmm. it just doesn't make sense at that mm -hmm. particular level mm -hmm. rebecca what are the what were the reactions on campus to the screenings of this film um did did people seem to get on board or i know that you know with pro-life activism on campus uh there's a lot of hostile forces there yeah, there was a lot of good reactions, not just to the screening, but to the rest of our campaign, which involved distributing thousands of resources and information on campuses. So a lot of students were you know, at information tables talking to people about the issue, having long conversations with them. Mm. And people, by and large, not just that they were encountering, but I've encountered in my life as well, whether it's on the sidewalk or at the university campus or at breakfast with a group of friends, is that Canadians are concerned about this issue, mm -hmm. not just because of what's happening in Canada, but the global ramifications of this issue. People are starting to see the global ramifications of sex selection abortion happening on a really large scale. So they're looking at China, they're looking at India like this documentary looks at, but they're also looking at other countries where this is happening and the effect that it has on the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter, short of banning abortion, which seems a long way off, they don't even want to talk about it in Parliament, what can be done about sex selection abortion? Well, I think, you know, apart from banning uh, 
abortion generally, we have to work to build a culture of life. I think mm -hmm. we have to take a positive uh, tack on this. Uh, the church in Canada this year will be celebrating the first, hopefully, annual week for life and family between the feasts of Pentecost and Ascension. The idea is to focus on the role of the family mm. in promoting and safeguarding life. And I, I think that the love that we bring to our family, to our friends, and to society, our level of engagement in society, is a reflection of the love and support that we receive in the context of the family. Mm. And so from our perspective at Colt, we would say that the, the solution to this and other problems which confront us uh, is to support the family and uh, to support all that the family does in creating a culture of life. Mm. And what would you add to that, Moira, in terms of, of what can be done to, uh, to stop sex selection abortion? I really think the whole question of, of education as, as well as family life, good family life, of course, is a fundamental for society. I think so many of us uh, just don't really know what actually goes on. We, we, we stop our ears, in fact, when we're talking about this. I think, for example, that you know the, the motion that was brought forward doesn't even include all the other ways that sex selection abortion is being done. In, in, when you're talking about in vitro fertilization, women are getting you know that's pre-implantation pre genetic mm -hmm. diagnosis. That tells the sex of the baby at that very early stage. So mm -hmm. There's absolutely no doubt that um, statistics are, of course, extremely hard to find, but people in the in vitro fertilization industry know this, that, that babies are being, embryos are being transferred on the basis of gender. So it's not just because a, 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 an embryo has a, is showing a genetic defect mm -hmm. or anything like that. So it's, to me, it's always been education, 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 and on a very factual basis, you know, what actually is going on. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very slow, of course. You know, I think these things, because abortion has become in our very kind of, uh, politically correct society that we don't want to touch that and not just in parliament but in parliament at the minute for sure then I this constant uh, reinforcement I think by groups like Rebecca's and call mm -hmm. for always talking about just exactly what's going on here and the counteractions to this but we know uh, you know there's a conversion process that's needed but a good I, and I think that's spiritual and moral but I think it needs really good facts as well mm -hmm. and I think many of us are trying to provide the facts as mm -hmm. well Rebecca, being on the front lines of pro-life activism, does it feel like an uphill battle, not only having to change cultural attitudes towards women, which are behind this, but attitudes towards abortion and preborn life? It is a challenge, especially on university campuses, not just because a lot of Canadians are apathetic about the issue, but also because a lot of people don't want us to talk about them on university campuses. So unfortunately, we've had some struggles there with mm -hmm. clubs getting shut down or not being allowed to form or not being allowed to do certain activities. But the, the obstacles that we encounter, we can look at them as just roadblocks or we can look at them as opportunities to rise to the challenge and mm -hmm. to still get our message out there by taking advantage of those opportunities. And I think that's what transforming culture requires. It requires us to look at every uphill battle and find mm -hmm. a way just to um, use that as another opportunity to get closer to our goal. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to education, it comes down to transforming culture and we're really excited to see how university students are engaged in that. Mm -hmm. Well, thankfully, all three of you with your organizations are speaking about this issue. Now, we're all out of time, but we always give the last word to the Word of God. And our passage today is from the book of James. But the wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, without uncertainty or insincerity and the harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. Uh, final thoughts, Peter. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God incarnate, and as Gaudium et Spes says, uh, Jesus reveals man to himself, and so he is both the, mo the model and the means by which we interrelate with those in society. And so it's by cultivating a personal relationship with him that we are set at right and our relations with those in society are set at right. Mm -hmm. And it is by that means that we will overcome the question of abortion. Mm -hmm. And Maura, what does this passage call to mind for you? Well, if we are to obey uh, the, the, the great commandment to love one another, I think that really means we love one another from conception until natural death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Final thoughts, Rebecca? 
Uh, it reminds me of Blessed Mother Teresa saying that the greatest destroyer of peace in the world is abortion. And so what we have with the pro-life message, which is respecting all human life, being really consistent in how we approach human beings, is an opportunity to build a culture of peace. And I think that's only going to come when we start at respecting all human life. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Moira McQueen from the Canadian Catholic Bioethics Institute, Rebecca Richmond from the National Campus Life Network, and Peter Murphy from the Catholic Organization for Life and Family, joining us from Ottawa, where the March for Life is being held. Now, we remind you that that is on May 9th. It starts at noon on Parliament Hill, and we encourage you to go and make your voice heard. Uh, what can we do to stop gender side? We want to hear your opinion. Visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash salt and light TV. From all of us here at Salt and Light Television, thanks for watching.